I didn't introduce us. Uh, welcome in everyone. I just want to introduce attorney, uh, attorney Erman Dade, who is the founder of the Detroit uh, Immigration, and he's been practicing law for over 25 years. He, with a passion for helping his community in matters of immigration law, um, attorney Dade has actually proudly represented uh, individuals who, of course, needed visas, green cards, family immigration, even Canadian immigration, asylum, and more. He's fully licensed as an attorney in both the U.S. and Canada, cool. while also holding dual citizenship in both countries. As an experienced high-profile attorney, Attorney Date handles immigration legal cases uh, with tact and dedication. With that being said, I'll hand over today's collab to uh, Attorney John Vili, who will further uh, lead us into today's session. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. I appreciate it. Welcome, uh, Mr. Dade, uh, Mr. Urban. Um, yes. Really glad to have you guys. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, this is the Immigration Attorney Collab. Collab short for collaboration. This is where we get together on a weekly basis, just talk about what's going on in our practices and uh, special issues, interesting things, and uh, has a couple purposes. One is to, um, you know, maybe bounce off some ideas off each other, and maybe we get a little bit smarter. Also to kind of educate the world who may be watching about what we do and why we might be an interesting fit for to help them uh, with their uh, issues. So first question I'd like to know, uh, you know, Mr. Dade, how did you get in immigration? Um, you know, what do you enjoy about it? Tell us a little bit about uh, kind of what, what makes you get up in the morning and do this. Yeah, uh, I just uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy immigration. Uh, it's uh, what makes uh, you know the the countries grow and expand. I, I love immigrants. I love uh, uh, getting uh, positive results from people. Uh, you know, I, I have clients coming in from uh, you know all around the world, and just uh, to to see what a difference it makes for uh, a lot of uh, my clients, it's just truly amazing. So uh, uh, I practice both Canada and U.S. immigration law. So being here right at the busiest. Canada US border point, uh, the Detroit border point, it's uh, gives a really, really unique uh, perspective. So it's, uh, it's amazing just having uh, licensing in two countries and just yeah. seeing how Canada treats immigrants, how the US treats immigrants, and then how they, uh, the two countries kind of deal with uh, border issues too. So I, I, I just absolutely love it. Fantastic. Well, it's great to meet you. Um, I have a, I've had a couple clients in Detroit for a while. I represented Ziggy Ansa uh, for a few years. He was a defensive end for the Lions. I went up and watched a Detroit Green Bay Packers game on a Thursday night, uh, which uh, Detroit was winning 24 to nothing going into the fourth quarter. And um, they gave a, a phantom uh, roughing the passer call uh, to uh, um, uh Rodgers, who then uh, uh, scored a touchdown uh, through, through a, a Hail Mary touchdown pass. And I watched all the Detroit fans kind of get up and walk out. And it was it was rough and uh, ended up in some Detroit Red Wings bar where everybody was really friendly to each other for about 10 minutes. And then this huge fight, uh, you know, broke out between the Packers and Lions fans. And it was, uh, it was a fascinating evening, um, but uh, really enjoyed the people I got to meet up there. And uh I've met some cool attorneys from Detroit over the years. Uh, a lot of yes. them coming out and, of. And actually, a sports immigration is something uh, I, I practice a lot in, and, and oh, cool. a lot yeah. of people don't realize that uh, if you're an athlete, a professional athlete, uh, athlete or a top athlete around the world, you can come to the United States and get yeah. immigration just by being a top level football player, sure. basketball player. So for. Uh, Anyone who enjoys sports, I, I just uh, love that aspect too, uh, helping athletes come in here and uh, cool. get their paperwork in order. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about that. That's what that's what we do a lot of as well. Um, so tell me some of the, uh, there's some interesting ways to do that, right? So obviously we can talk about O and P visas and EB1s, uh, but you know, and also an interesting fact is crossing the border as an athlete, right? With, with uh, sports leagues that have teams on both sides, seems like those issues come up a lot. Or do you deal with some of those issues as well as getting the visas? Yes, yeah, uh, definitely. There's uh, there's issues with uh, athletes uh, and their immigration, just like uh, any other you know business people or other other visas and, and border mm -hmm. issues as well. So uh, whatever affects uh, just just regular normal individuals, for lack of a better word, it also will affect athletes in terms of uh, 
yeah. uh, immigration regulations. So they don't get any, uh, you know, special treatment for border issues or, or things like that. They have to comply with that. Uh, but, you know, other than that, it's uh, they, they do have special categories, like you mentioned, extraordinary ability, mm-hmm. uh, either a permit under the O's or uh, or a green card. So, um, you know, and, and I think a lot of people don't realize that you don't actually have to be a major big name athlete. You can be a minor athlete and uh, uh, possibly get immigration as well, just the way the regulations work out. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that's a you. You know, very interesting area. Uh, of one yeah. of the, the small areas we practice in. Take take us through some of the, the strategies you use for some athletes like that. What are, uh, and, and what's kind of helpful if this, if you wouldn't mind, is because we can really get into the weeds really quickly. But yeah. I remember some of the people aren't immigration attorneys and at all. So if you can kind of say, like, here's one of the visas I use, here's the strategy I use, and then some examples of, of how you maybe have done it. Well, you know, it, it's it's amazing that a lot of athletes don't realize this. So, like, I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, you know, without giving away too much confidence. But sure. I had someone just come in and they wanted to extend their visitor visa because they were here. Uh, a lot of, for, for whatever reason, a lot of athletes use the visitor uh, visa to come in and, and play mm. uh, for whatever sports. And then I'm, I'm talking to him and he's been in, you know, featured in newspapers and uh, won awards. And he's asking me to do a visitor visa extension. That's all he was expecting. And I'm, yeah. I'm telling him that, well, would you like a green card? And he was just shocked. I mean, I can get a green card for my, me and my whole family. Right. I said, yes, because you're like a top level athlete. I sure I can do a visitor visa extension, but I could do adjustment of status. Yeah. Uh, so he was a little bit in shock, but, but, and they also don't know that you, they can expedite these things with premium processing. So that's another uh, bonus. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that's one strategy, uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I, of course there's the well-known sports, but I also like to do, uh, um, you know, sports that are famous or, or I guess popular in some countries that are not as well-known here, Mm -hmm. they still qualify as well. So, uh, a special type of wrestling that's common in India Mm -hmm. that Americans have no idea what it is, but they qualify just as much. Oh, that that's, that's, that's kind of fun because you get the opportunity to educate them a little bit on you know what the sport works like and and stuff like that yeah we we do that as well and uh we're we're doing a lot of uh cases in rugby right now so uh we have to what's really some of the things aren't obvious right so in in rugby um they have international leagues some are that are more elite than others and then they they have some that are domestic leagues and then they have some that are international leagues where professional teams in one country will play professional teams in other countries. And those aren't even as national teams. So one of the things that we have to do is educate the adjudicators on how do we determine whether somebody is internationally recognized as exceptional or how do we how do we educate them on how they're extraordinary of you know, those being the P visa and the O visa categories. And and so what what's really interesting is how do you get experts to help you? And how do you help experts um, understand what they're doing? Because w- what I what I've seen, and maybe we can talk a little bit about this, is many times you'll see an expert try to write a letter, and the expert absolutely knows everything about their industry, but they don't always know, and they wouldn't know or shouldn't know how the regulations are designed and what standards they meet. So you'll see them ride along for a while on somebody, but the adjudicator has to make a determination on how is this thing, say, a, 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 uh, an elite award, or how is it a membership in an organization that requires outstanding achievements? And the, the expert doesn't know how to do that, right? So it's really interesting how we have to be the, the immigration knowledge base and then help the experts be able to do that. So do you have some examples or things that you've done around that on how you've helped win some of these cases in, in those ways? Yeah, yeah. Um... Experts are interesting. Uh, you know, some of my clients are just, they're top level athletes. So they themselves are experts and sure. their friends are experts. Right. Because if you're a pro level, whatever, basketball or whatever sport, chances are your friends are also at yeah. your level, you know? So, uh, and, and I know there's some policies that they don't like letters from friends or things like that, but still yeah. I, I do go into their network. I, the first thing mm-hmm. I ask is, well, Hey, you're a top level, whatever. Do you have, do you know anyone who's at your level or beyond? For sure. And I, I include those and they, you'd be surprised. They know some 
really impressive athletes that you can get hundred percent from. Yeah, no, that I, I totally agree with that. And uh, so I, I like to use this as a strategy, right? So you should never have somebody. I see there's a difference between an expert, which is somebody that that should be independent, and they should be able to provide some some sort of knowledge about it. They they shouldn't just say an awards an award or an organization's an organization. They should bring something from their perspective that will help the adjudicator learn a little bit more, right? I mean, that's, they, they shouldn't just say, you know, I'm the expert, I'm telling you this is this, 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 this. That's what we do at least. And so I, I totally agree with you. I think an expert should not be a boss or a coach or someone they've coached. There shouldn't be a vested reason in having them approved. But obviously a colleague is somebody they know. And if that colleague is not, doesn't have a vested interest, then they are really good experts, but they should be talking about the industry, not about that they're a fact witness, right? So I, I like to use this analogy that I always go back to like, if we were trying this in court, right? That a fact witness would be able to tell you whether somebody murdered somebody else because they saw him stab them with a knife. Whereas- This is getting gruesome. Yeah, I know, sorry about that. <laughs> Expert, whereas an expert would say, I'm going to use my expertise to tell you I've studied, you know, the, the knife, I've studied the blood, I've, the hair follicles. And based on my knowledge, I can tell you from an expert perspective that there's a 99% chance this person did it, right? So an expert is to provide background based on what they know and help the adjudicator understand what they can't know by looking at it, obviously. that that's Those are some of the techniques we've used uh, to, to do that and how we've helped the experts with their letters, right? As opposed to say, just write. Yeah, the, the thing that's just, um, you know, and I understand the client's point of view, but sometimes you, you get the reference letters where it's like, he's a really hard worker and a right, wonderful right, team right. player. And Absolutely. I think he's going to make a great contribution to the United States. He's so passionate about his sport. And I'm like, no, that won't help us very much, you know? Nothing there, uh, right? so the yeah that's kind of the the first part of the kind of educate especially like athletes they may not have written um reference letters like this before so that's right uh it's it's really important to kind of let them know what the officer's looking for which can be really technical so um well that's you know it is what it is immigration's much more technical than people realize for sure i think that's the first step let them know that well, that, that's good stuff. So tell us what other types of visas besides the athlete-based visas uh, do you practice? Well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I was going to make a joke about we do criminal defense of murderers or and, you know, forensics. If you have like, if you just killed someone, please call me. No, uh, we just do immigration. That's it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I some of my favorite cases, just because uh, we're situated here at the border and I am a, a attorney in both countries, are Canada, mm-hmm. U.S., uh, cases, which yes, uh, you know, athletes, you know, the, the best hockey players are from Canada, they would argue, I would say, you know, it depends. But uh, in terms of other cases, uh, investors are really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, you know, we like to help Canadians expand into the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just such a bigger market here in the US. Sure. Uh, and you have some really talented business people in Canada who want to expand down here. So that's, uh, you know, and vice versa. Sometimes there's US companies that want to expand in Canada. Uh, so that's uh, uh, something we, we do a lot of. And then uh, border issues. Uh, Americans um, are surprised to know that Canada can ban them. Uh, so right. you know, Americans yeah. are not allowed into Canada with right. most criminal records, including DUIs. So the DUI is a big uh, one, isn't it? Yeah. So the you know I'll get a call from a pilot or a businessman right. or uh, whatever, and they'll say that Canada banned me because I have a DUI from a you know a party from four years ago. So we, we help clear up uh, the like they're kind of like waivers for um, you know so it's the reverse of a U.S. waiver. We do Canadian waivers so they can overcome their criminal yeah. inadmissibility. We we get that from time to time and don't know where to don't know where to go about it, right? So there, it's it's funny. That's why we love doing these collabs because there's so many different ways you can practice immigration law in so many different niches that you can yeah. Uh, anyone who needs a criminal waiver to get into Canada, well, vice versa, of course, but to get into yeah. Canada, we can do those criminal waivers for them. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that, um, without you know giving away your secret sauce, but just a little bit about what are some of the crimes that you talked about DUIs, and what do you have to do to get 
this waiver? What, who who can get them? Who can't get them? That would be helpful. Yes, yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it's it's first of all, it's the standard of what is considered a crime in Canada. So there are some crimes in the U.S. which aren't even crimes in Canada. So that mm-hmm. would not ban you. Okay. Uh, you know, so that that's one one important uh, thing there. Uh, but the otherwise. Uh, you know, the, there, there's a variety of different types of waivers which have different, you know, standards. But uh, let's say someone has a criminal record from, you know, last year, but they have to be in Canada for a business meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to establish the compelling need, uh, whether there's risks to Canadians. So they, they look at factors of if there's violence involved, drugs involved, weapons yeah. involved, uh, you know, uh, likelihood of uh, reoffending. So uh, the safety of Canadians is paramount. Uh, so for violent crimes, it's a little bit more difficult to get these waivers. Nonviolent crimes, uh, if it's a compelling need and it's something relatively minor, you know, shoplifting or something, uh, uh, we, we can get those w- with the arguments. Um, mm. You know, you can get this permanently cured if it's been over five years in most cases. Uh, and that's a different type of waiver. And there's that's a showing your rehabilitation. There's a, I've, I think I've heard of this and I don't know enough about it. So if you could tell yeah. us that. So there's a, a waiver that can get you across the border like immediately in one. Yeah. And then a, and a waiver that gets you done, like you'll never have to deal with it again. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. The two types. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Or just arguing that it's not a crime in Canada, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there are some minor crimes. If it's been over 10 years, you're uh, automatically deemed rehabilitated. Mm. Well, that's wild. Uh, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, how long does it take um, if, say, for example, someone goes to the border, didn't know it was an issue. They got a big sporting event uh, that they're going up for. Right. I imagine this is one of the fact patterns. Right. And you're like, yeah. what do you mean I can't get into the rest of my team's going in? We're, we're playing today. It can some of those waivers be done immediately or do they take a long time? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good, good question. So the Canadian border officer does have a broad amount of discretion. So they can let you in uh, mm-hmm. with minimal amount of paperwork. If it's something super urgent, um, you know, Canada's pretty, you know, but if it's, unfortunately, if it's, if it's more of a serious crime, they won't, right. They, they you know, uh, or, or someone, or if they have a huge criminal record with 35 right. arrests or something, you know, right. they, they, they won't allow it usually that that's like right away it, it makes can... sense to me right so you know yeah. you had a dui while you're in college you're now 35 years old or and and you haven't had any issues before you're you've obviously rehabilitated you're not a you're not a recidivist or repeat offender and and uh they're like okay we're gonna let you come up and play your sports game right we're not gonna give you the permanent one right now but come on up and, and get out of here and be too yeah, Canada is kind of an interesting country of what they consider compelling or not. So yeah. sports, they're big on sports, so right. they'll facilitate. Right. They're yeah. really big on hunting. So if someone wants to go up and hunt, um, they will. They consider that an urgent, compelling need because it helps control some of the population of whatever overpopulation of bears or deer. So they they are big on helping hunters. That's, uh, I think, maybe 25% of what we do is helping hunter, U.S. hunters, wow. who all have DUIs. Hunters and DUIs right. go hand-in-hand hand like peanut butter and jam. I mean, they just yeah. don't know why. And, and the Canadians um, are okay with the drunk guy with a gun. <laughs> yeah, as long as they're shooting animals, go crazy. I mean, yeah, they, they, they want you to come and kill their animals up there. So um, <laughs> pretty humorous. it's just Canada, right? Yeah, they, they like that sort of stuff. So tell us, um, so we see, you know, down here, we heard, you know, Canada said, hey, if you're going to block all these people on H-1Bs, we'll take them. Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, that from an immigration perspective. Um, What was the the visa type? How long did it take? How many people came up? Were you involved in any of this? What what was that? Canada poaches immigrants from uh, the U.S. all the time. I mean, just uh, Canada doesn't understand why. America's like kicking, you know, AI engineers and computer engineers. And like uh, you you have graduates here from, you know, university of like, you know, whatever prestigious university with computer degrees and technology degrees. And they they can't even get a green card in Canada. They will take you. I mean, you know, their H1B is expiring. Your work permit's expiring. Canada has um, and and it's been ongoing for like 20 plus years. Yeah. H1B 
is, is a Canadian favorite because it's already been vetted by right. the U.S. They know. So basically, so if you have an H-1B, they look at, hey, somebody else adjudicated this as part of their process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Fascinating. Take, take, take your They'll take your H-1Bs happily. Canada, America doesn't want them. Canada will take all of, all of yeah. them. Yeah. No, I get it. Canada's right on this, by the way. Um, I don't blame them. But I think what it is is, one, political, um, and two, the demand, right? So um, if America, if the demand wasn't as high, Americans would have less onerous immigration. Um, it, but they're just doing it. I, I was talking to somebody about it yesterday. It's a hard, long process and frustrating and inconsistent because that's how they deter, right? It's like the people that should just be doing their job, it's in front of them, give them a yes, have somehow woven politics into it to like, well, I'm just going to negate some percentage of them just so we don't have as many people coming in as if that's their job. And it's not. And so it's funny because the people that are making these decisions are not politically appointed people. They're bureaucrats, right? The politically appointed ones are ones coming up with policies. But maybe that policy is let's just frustrate this, <laughs> right? Let's make it let's make it hard so that um, as many people don't come through, which is weird, but that seems to be what's happening. Yeah, yeah, and they uh, and. A, a large percentage of uh, H-1B foreign workers are from India. Right. And even if, if they got a job offer, a permanent job offer, for them to get a green card, they sometimes have to wait 10 plus years to get the green card, whereas yeah, they can crazy. just go to Canada, become a Canadian citizen. And come back. And come back under NAFTA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so it's, um, it, it is a good workaround for, for, for that subgroup as well. I've, uh, I've experienced that. I, uh, you know, I, I deal with a lot of Indians on the tech sa side, a lot of H-1Bs, a lot of perms. Matter of fact, we have an office in India now. Um, but when I first got into Indians, it was the Gujaratis and their hotel owners. And so these guys were many, most of them living in the Toronto area. And uh, we brought them down on E-2s to buy hotels. And then we would take them from E-2s to EB-5s. And it was uh, fun and fascinating and cool but you know they all became canadians first and all the clients i had um it was a you're you're right there's a there's a there's a flow there and um yeah like you're, you're doing some employers are frustrated with u.s immigration so i read in the news that microsoft set up a tech center in vancouver canada sure uh because they're, they're just fed up with u.s politics regulations to get work permits yeah for for, for workers they'll just set up in canada i mean yeah. it's across the border so so it's neat that you're doing both um that's uh they they work differently but i guess at some general ways they work the same you're you're dealing with a government agency you're filling in forms you're writing documents you're analyzing the regulations and i would assume if you're legally permitted to do both the difference between a canadian visa and an american visa can be the same as between one american visa and another american visa right they yeah, yeah, it, it is, work. you know, and they're the same, except Canada is not trying to frustrate like prime really? workers. There's there's global competition for computer, foreign computer engineers, yeah. software engineers, technology that yeah. uh, countries are competing for these workers that America's just like uh, letting them just seep out. And then and then you hear politicians saying we're going to be competitive for the, you know, they're, it doesn't make any sense, it's, you know, help these uh, workers come into the U.S., not help them go to other countries is what we're yeah. doing. Well, I, I think everybody that, that, that we have on this program agrees 100% with you because we're in the we're in the business and uh, we want to see it happen as well. Uh, but that's interesting that Canada doesn't have that as much. What do does Canadian immigration have issues with numeric caps or long lines with any of its types of visas or what are some of the frustrating parts in trying to practice Canadian law that's different than frustrating parts in American law? You know, Canada, um, well, they, they, first of all, Canada treats all immigrants equal regardless of country at birth, whereas the U.S. does not. So if you're mm -hmm. from China or India or some other country, you have to wait longer than everybody else. Right. Canada doesn't have that. So that yeah. is a plus. But the, the challenging part is they have an English or French language testing requirement. Mm. For a lot of these things so depending on the type has to be fluent in english or french to get the immigration which 
Interesting. biases some countries and excludes others. So that right. it's, it's kind of in a way, um, kind of similar that it's frustrating certain countries where, uh, uh, you know, English is not the uh, spoken at all. So, um, that, that, that's one thing, uh, you know, I, I do like the U S system in that the immigration system is more, I guess, efficient. The, the technology is there. They have portals or websites and phone numbers and it's just, you know, but Canada is a little bit more, I don't want to use the word backwards, but the, their immigration system is not as sophisticated as the U S. So it's harder to interact with the uh, Canadian, you know, officers than it is in the U S if that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're more sophisticated because we're more negative, <laughs> right? In some ways, right? I mean, I, I think we, what we, I've seen over my career is, is more and more creative ways on how to deny a visa, right? So, you know, I think a lot of visas have gotten more difficult over time and it's made us have to be better lawyers. And, you know, one of the things and why we've developed, you know, visas.ai as a tool is that I, I started with EB1s, right? I, my very first visa was a was an extraordinary ability green card for rugby because I was a rugby player. One of my teammates was a rugby player. It had just gone professional, right? And so I got the first green card for a rugby player. And then rugby players around the country called me because if you're licensed in any state, you can practice in all states, right? So I quickly did rugby players. A lot of these guys lived in Aspen. It went into skiing. So it all starts for sports for me, then evolved into tech and a medical and all these different things. I, I, I couldn't have ever planned the, the path that it went, but it, it's where it went. And it was all interesting. So the EB, I was litigating, right? And, and so the EB1s w- reminded me of litigation because it was so, it was so subjective. How do I prove this? How do I prove that? I would throw some cases in. And then, you know, more I got into it, the less I saw lawyers lawyering, right? The less I saw that they were they were they were arguing facts with this agency. And 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 it reminded me of some different types of litigation you would do. Like if you're gonna litigate in federal court in America, you gotta know your rules. It's very, very complex. State courts not quite as complex. City court or you know, municipal courts aren't that. And then if you do an agency court, right? A they're really loose, right? Just kind of tell us what you want. We'll figure it out. So immigration law was more is an agency based adjudication. So they wanted to argue facts the way they want to see it. So what what I started because I was litigating cases in in federal court, you had to be so good, right? Or you get crushed by your opposing counsel. I'm like, why don't we brief where people are doing cover letters? So we started briefing and we were very proud that we write more than everybody else. And we had a really good approval rating not that I'm a smarter guy, but because our processes were more sophisticated and we were actually reminding them that there are there are cases and there are regulations and there are memos and all of them give you instruction. So we're not just going to argue the facts and you take it whichever way you want. We're framing it. <laughs> we're framing it. This issue has already been decided and here's where the out of bounds are. And we're right here in the middle. So don't just try to say whatever, right? And so we invented our technology because none of the other technology had briefed. Right. All the other technology is still to this day is all around forms. Right. And you can lose a case on a form, but you can never win a case on a form. That's where you use strategy and you argue and stuff like that. And they've always let lawyers go do that on ourselves. So we, what we wanted to do is how do we bring briefing? How do we attach it to the form and the other documents? Right. So expert letters, business plans that comply with matter of hoe, all these other things. How can we how can we create that? So that's what I discovered kind of is. We can we can be better lawyers here and give our give our clients a better thing. We just think about how we say what we're doing. So as a segue, can you share some cool arguments that you've made over the years that you know you're proud of? Like, hey, I, I came up with this and this worked, or I went this way and, and stuff like that. Cool arguments. Um, my Great. arguments are pretty cool. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, how do where do I? Um, across the entire entire gambit of, uh, you know, it it is nice when you win in federal court. Um, You know, I actually have the uh, kind of the unique perspective. I've litigated cases in in U.S. federal court and Canadian federal court. So that's really cool trying to like, you know, kind of seeing how justice is administered in federal courts in two different countries. Uh, You know, so um, 
Well, I mean, you know, there was a criminal waiver case I did in federal court. I think it's probably public information, but to be careful, I'll just yeah, be kind of skew it, you know, make it a bit fuzzy. But, the, you know, the bottom line is, um, you know, the, this person actually um, accidentally killed somebody. Oh. It was an accident, you know, vehicles and things like that. So he was banned, uh, applied, and they Canada denied it. We applied again, Canada denied it. We argued it, we argued it, and we argued it. But, you know, in federal court, um, you know, we, we kind of, we, we challenged all of that, put, put forth the arguments and, uh, you know, it's from my experience anyways, it's being creative with opposing counsel and kind yeah. of, you know, it, it's partly legal and partly psychology. So if you <laughs> kind of get your opposing counsel psychology, right, you can kind of win them over, you know? So, uh, you know, so I, I kind of, um, you know, opposing counsel uh, was a bit soft, you know, she was a bit soft hearted, I guess, for lack of a better word. So I kind of played on the positive equities and say, look, he's a family man. Look at all of this. He didn't wake up in the morning with a plan to go and murder somebody. Right. Wow. So the, the whole point is the protection of Canadians. And if you just accidentally run over somebody, uh, of course, he fled the scene or whatever, but it's complicating factors. But so he might not be the greatest, you know, it might not be the best moral judgment, but he's not going to the, the odds of him killing someone again is astronomically small. It was a traffic accident, right? I mean, he fled the scene, of course. But so anyway, I, I think playing on. Um, I find I find justice. Um, they are humans at the end of the day. So if yeah. I have compelling optics in federal court, um, oh, this one was cool. The the person was uh, uh, banned from the U.S. for like stealing food, right? So I, I just played it like this person was just hungry you know what, what they call extenuating circumstances you know and i, I said like this shouldn't uh it, it, it's not vile depraved conduct you know if yeah. you're stealing food to feed yourself so i i thought that was a great argument as well I, good optics on the humanitarian side I, I think when you're dealing with opposing counsel and they don't want the government to look bad or you know they think of it that leaks out of the media i find them a little bit more easier to work with so that, that those are some of the uh i don't know if that was cool enough i don't no, that is cool. I mean, well, that's that's what we want here, right? Um, so yeah. exactly, anecdotes. How did you do it? Where did you do it? Those are great uh, solutions, right? And and to look, the funny thing is, is what you just said is really basic if you think about it. Play to how people think, right? Play play the man, not the game. And what you found in one of them was somebody that wasn't a mean spirited person. They're going to have to come home and talk to whoever their spouse is or family and say, you know, I banned somebody from coming to this country because they accidentally hurt somebody, right? And they and they thought it through and they had the spirit of it. And I think at the end of the day, some things we forget is that we're not the only decision maker in this equation. And I learned that in federal court um, in, in DC was the way those judges looked at their cases, it was their case, not mine. I always thought this is my case and I have to provide the best argument and the defense is going to try to stop it. And that's their job. But the judges were fascinating because I, I went up and I, I listened to at the D.C. Circuit Court two days of arguments. And what I discovered I hadn't thought about, which was really interesting, is that the reason that they would say, counsel, tell us how this applies to the 1912 case of Jones versus Smith wasn't to trump the lawyer. It's because they're going to make new law, and that's what it's going to be. And they're responsible for what that case is. Now, the way they did it was a little mean-spirited, and it would trip these lawyers up, and it would make them look bad. But I don't think that's really what they were after. They were, they were trying to say, if you're going to make me overturn Jones v. Smith, you better give me a compelling reason why. And just because you didn't know because it was in 1912, that's your problem, not mine. And But I would see one after another – these these judges almost you know it was a game they were playing like what about this case and what about that case and you knew you could tell immediately that the attorneys had no idea what they were talking about right like they knew their cases and they knew their opposing counsel cases but they didn't know these other cases but i love it when that happens by the way when the judge goes what about this case and it's like well, <laughs> the only case i didn't read right. yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah. Or you just start talking, right, and, and hope that you can, like, deviate somewhere else, get back to what you want to talk about. Oh, that's a great case. Went in our favor. How about I tell you about this other case? Yeah. 
Yeah. I have a cool case going on right now in federal court. I think it's pretty cool now that I had time to think. But right. it's there was a case out of New York. Uh, I forget the citation where they, they said that uh, you cannot search an individual's cell phone at the border without oh. a warrant. Really? Something like that came out. I, you know, it was recent. Well, that's great to know. You know, so I'm applying that to a um, case because there's these uh, CBP has uh, uh, these inspection stations in Canada as well. You know, the, you know, different yeah. Canadian international airports. So they searched a Canadian cell phone without a warrant, you know, which uh, is kind of against the evolving uh, case law here in the U.S. where you need a warrant to do that. So. Now I'm arguing, well, that should apply to officers at foreign airports, U.S. officers at foreign airports as well. Yeah, they, they can't grab American people's cell phones right? without a warrant. Yeah. So tell me this. This is interesting. Um, so CBP officer searches a cell Sorry phone. Sorry to cut you off, John. Just uh, one minute. I can hear you. Time check. Oh, you yeah. can hear me now. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Hi. Yeah. Hi, so Attorney Dave. Uh, really just talking. a reminder that we're reaching the end of today's session. Oh, yeah. I know you got to go. So I'm going to ask him one more question. Um, so someone searches, th this is a, a, a interesting on how do you bring this case? Because my understanding, and, I, and I, mean, I need you to educate me on it, is CBP has a lot of discretion. The consulate officials have a lot of discretion. CBP searches the cell phone. How do you bring that cause of action against them for doing this? Uh, do they, um, is that just so arbitrary and capricious that it's a violation? And, and you can get them on it, whereas if they just said no for no reason without doing the cell phone, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it? it it's just basically relying on uh, – the. I, I wish I had the cite. Here we go. I don't have the citation on the case we're talking about. But in New York, they, they said you, you need a warrant for that now. It's a yeah. violation of their uh, – you know, a violation of their privacy rights. So, um, uh, so you know, that, that, that that's what this one New York judge had stated. So I'm just trying to apply that to uh, – um, you know, not just the, the U.S. Canada border or just you know border entry points, but also at anywhere pre-clearance centers. You know, so uh, so how would you know, you I think we have a motion hearing next month on this. Yeah, how would you mechanically bring that cause of action? Federal court. Yeah, Detroit federal court. Yep. Yeah. Violation of the Agency Procedures Act and yeah, and the Constitution, uh, the constitutional, constitutional. Uh, violations as well. And if so, they denied their entry on that, and you got that overturned, would your request be that they would be able to enter the united states under that visa is that the relief you'd be seeking yeah i mean yeah uh, in this case it's a canadian doesn't even need a visa so they just found stuff on his cell phone which they just grabbed and searched it or, or whatever it was and uh hmm. you know the basically the way the law is evolving is you know border officers have the right to search your car your luggage you know they're looking for whatever it is you're smuggling yeah. goods or you know dangerous yeah. stuff but um the cell phone is a different animal i mean that's your yeah. personal yeah, that's highly personal. So the courts are starting to recognize that's not the same as opening a trunk and looking for, you know, There's illegal no substances. Cell phone. It's just information, right? Yeah, and yeah. Get, and that's your information. You get to know it. You get to keep it and stuff like I that. Mean, does anyone here want a border guy looking through their cell phone and their emails not. and <laughs> of course not. Their vacation not photos? Media. and Yeah, that's yeah. great. Well, look, I love that you're fighting those fights. Those are uh, that's that's good. That's not normal um, in 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 the everyday life of most immigration attorneys. Um, I think most of us uh, put packages together and mail it off and wait for a response to come back. It's really cool that you're on the the front lines of some of these uh, these battles, um, and that, and that is cool uh, from 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 this guy's perspective at least. Yep, I wanted to meet your cool standards, so I appreciate yeah, I got did. to that you level. Did. You exceeded my cool standards. Thank you for awesome. that. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, thank I hear you, you so had a hard much. stop right about three minutes ago. So, uh, yes. yeah. Really DetroitImmigration.com if anyone wants to, yeah. to see our website or whatever. Um, Dayton Associates, that's us. All right. Fantastic. Jay, thanks so much. Alex, you got anything? Before uh, I let him go, I just wanted to introduce off? myself. I've been a silent observer over here, but um, my name's Gabby. I wear many hats at the firm, but. Um, I also lead some of our partnerships and, you know, we have been ser searching for um, a partnership with the Canadian immigration firm. So you may be hearing from me. I'd love to set up a conversation offline with you and John. Um, I mean, this is just a great avenue for us to meet other folks and um, would love to keep the, the synergy going. So I may be reaching out to you in the near future. Yep. So I just want to introduce myself. So I'm not a stranger. Hi. Hi nice Gabby. to meet you. 
what, yeah, would what, love to collaborate and, and partner with all these Canadian stuff. Definitely. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. And thank you guys for the opportunity. Really appreciate it.